on Aristotle's virtue ethics. And uh, we're going to be uh, doing, uh, well, something called a topic test to begin today. See how what we know so far. So what I want you to do is in the, uh, in the Google Classroom ethics, you've obviously found us, so that's great. Um, where it says topic tests, and I want you both to open up test, not the answers, uh, the test, the, the test. So don't open the answers, that's cheating. <laughs> Just go for the, you know, go for the, the test. Okay, now, first come, first serve in any particular box, uh, but see if you can type a couple of answers in. So that starts easy and gets a bit harder, all right? So these are um, questions. Uh, um, let's see, so these are, what I've, I've done is for the entire course, I've created a, a list of questions and answers. Um, that is, well, it's kind of A grade. If you did, if you knew it all, it would be A grade. If you knew about 80% of it, it would be like B grade or C grade, that sort of thing. All right, so pick a question and see if you can answer one. Uh, so we're all working in the same document, so you'll have to first come, first serve, and whatever questions you choose. Somebody else joining us. No? Good man, Josh. So Josh is going ethical theories that emphasize virtues of mind, self, honesty. Yeah, okay. What do we call those? Uh, virtue, honesty, what kind of virtue is that? There's a category of virtue. What, do you, what would you call that, Josh? Another word for ethics begins with m. <laughs> hey, very good. Now, virtues of mind, a big word beginning with I. This would be thinking virtues or beginning with I. There. So Aristotle talked about moral virtue and uh, beginning with I. Another word for m for thinking, rationality, or to do with your mind or your in almost E, go with E, e no, in, not in, shoot, no, 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 I-N-T, E, in, te, no, L, in, tell, in, what's to do with your mind? Ah, there you go. There are the intellectual virtues and there are the moral virtues. For example, um, honesty, the virtue of the mind. Okay, see if you can pick another one. Have a go. Um, I see where we haven't found. Uh, Ollie hasn't found us. You all right, Ollie? Um, Ollie's disappeared. Let's check the chat. No, no questions. Are you there, Ollie? Can't find the, the doc. Okay, have a go one more, Josh. Pick a question. I'll have a read done. Which lesson? Where do I find it? Mine's oh, right. sorry, Ollie. Uh, if you go in the... Well, I'll show you now. If you go in ethics... Um, 5.1, Immanuel Kant and Aristotle. And then if you go down to just after lesson five, it should say topic tests. And in that, if you click on test one. Still struggling, Ollie? 
Ah, you, you're in. Good man. Good man. So scroll down, just find a question, have a go at it. So Josh has answered the question, what for Aristotle does the good life consist of? The rational faculties engaging in scientific inquiry, philosophical discussion, creation of legislation. That's, that's really good, Josh. That's really good. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, building, ver has somebody else arrived? Ah, more people are here. Excellent. Who's arrived? Uh, Florence, Flo, well, welcome. How are you? Sorting your... Uh, hiya, sir. Okay. Um, right, Flo, uh, if you could go to the Google Classroom and you could go to the ethics, uh, A-level ethics, Google Classroom, looks a bit like this, and then go to 5.1. And then just after L5, you will five, find something that says topic tests. Open it up and click on test one. And you can come and join us. Oh, no, don't. No. So I might not be able to do that. Oh, you're on your phone. Okay. Well, all right. Yeah. I'll, I'm sorry. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quiz you on your phone. So I'm gonna give you a question, and I'll type the answer in for you. All right. If I asked you, asked you the question, what is Nicomachean ethics? Okay, that's Aristotle's first book, and it was. Oh. She... Is that right? Is that wrong? That is spot on. That is absolutely spot on. Oh, sweet. Thank you. All right. So you can see me typing it in for you on your behalf. Thank you. I'll put flow was here. Um, <laughs> uh, what is what is it? Uh, here we go. What is. Oh, uh, he's ready. There you go. Somebody's answered this really. What's the purpose of life? Uh, to reach eudaimonia. Definition of eudaimonia. Human flourishing. Yeah. We, oh. we'll, have, we'll, do, we'll do one of our own. Um, okay, here's one for you. What is arete? I'm not my Greek's terrible. What is anarete? Or oh, I oh, I do know this. Is it possibly a virtue? Or no, yes, one? yes. It's your virtues. Okay. It's your your. I guess it means your strengths or your traits. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, thanks, traits. Uh, do you want anything? Uh, what's that's uh, that's quite a hard one. What did Aristotle say about the traits? Bit difficult. So there's there's easy and difficult in here. There were seven of them. Say that again. There were seven of them, possibly. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could say. Uh, he said, well, the act 12, I'm going to, I'm going to correct you. So there's 12 moral virtues. Oh, and there were I want this one. There were heavenly virtues and the sins were deadly sins. Good. Now that was, let me ask you a question. Was Aristotle a Christian? No. No. So would he have talked about heavenly, deadly sins and heavenly virtues? Who would talk about like that? What, oh, what? Aquinas. Aquinas. So that was Aquinas' redefinition oh. of it. Tell me, what's the doctrine of the mean? The average between like a virtue, like between buffoonery and the other one. Uh, between It's the average between vices of excess and deficiency. Uh, 
E.G. Buffoonery and um, so buffoonery is the vi the vice of excess of wit wittiness. What's the uh, being dull. dull? Yeah, don't. That's terrible. Imagine if, if you were called dull. Yeah, that would be just like the worst thing, wouldn't it? Uh, E.G. Uh, mm -hmm. Virtue equals being witty. Um, would you rather be dull or a buffoon? <laughs> You'd really like to be witty, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Right. Okay. So this was just I. What I'm doing for the entire course, I'm trying to at least, is create some questions and answers. You guys can just work your way through. Now, what I'm going to show you is the answers. Uh, so you all have a look at my screen. And here are the test one answers. But you can see, actually, I'll show the question bank. Um, forget it says natural moral law at the top. That was my bad. It should say virtue ethics. Um, and so what is virtue ethics? It's a non-normative ethical theory which emphasizes the importance of moral agents, the intellectual and moral virtue. So well done, Josh. That was pretty good. What's the midpoint between excess and deficiency? Well, it's it's virtue. Um, the purpose of life, the good life, consists in achieving your potential, your virtuous potential, building your character. Virtue ethics, most basically, is agent-centered. Uh, it's the book. Nicomann Cain is the book that Aristotle wrote. Uh, eudaimonia is the purpose of life, uh, the well-lived life. Uh, the definition is human flourishing. Or um, And then what is happiness? Well, that's the final goal. That's the aim of uh, the best human life. Uh, it's a good that is rather, not a God, but a good that should be desired for its own sake. Um, and Aristotle talks about this is when the soul is in accordance with its strengths, with its traits, with its virtue, the soul in accordance with its virtue. Um, how does Aristotle's definition of happiness differ from the Aquinas? Well, let's see if anybody got this. What do we get? I'm going to flip between them. Um, yeah, so we've got to do a bit of work. Okay. Um, hedonists and utilitarianists and ordinary people think of happiness as basically equaling pleasure. But for Aristotle, happiness was something more than that. In a sense, you could be happy when you're miserable or not feeling pleasure because you're achieving your... Uh, your purpose, your function in life, um, when your moral and intellectual arete or virtues increasing. Um, now, I'm going to pause there, but you get the idea, don't you? Um, and you could go through all of my questions and it would give you, I'm going to post up some of these tests. Uh, and at the end of the test, there are three or four questions from other bits of the course, what I call interleaved questions. So it's a good way of uh, revising and doing things. Okay, we'll crack on today uh, with what we're doing today then. Um, so we should be able to answer questions like this. What is prudence? Um, and explaining Aristotle's, so prudence is uh, prenesis or practical wisdom. Aristotle's concept of virtuous role models. Well, we learned that, that um, being an a inspiration, an exemplar, is very important for Aristotle. We learn role models through that and so on. We might even do some of these deeper questions that you, know, you could think about in Aristotle. Can only clever people be moral? No. Um, but it helps if you have pronesis, if you have prudence, which is a sort of intellectual virtue. Can only rich people be moral? No. Um, certainly anyone can develop their, their virtues, but it has to be asked because it was quite elitist, his theory. Um, so perhaps there are certain morals, intellectual virtues in particular, that can only be developed by rich people. What is the ultimate good? Well, to eudaimonia, to live the well-lived life. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's a mixture of individual and social well-being. The doctrine of the mean, the, the virtue between the vices of excess and deficiency. Uh, what are two extremes is, what two extremes is virtue? Ah, oh, right, whatever. Moving on. Okay. So very simple today. Uh, we're going to cover, so if you're making some notes, uh, three people. 
Uh, we thought about virtue ethics at last lesson in the Middle Ages, Aquinas' adoption, his, um, and whether it works or doesn't work. And then we come and to a sort of lull in intellectual respectability of virtue uh, as the utilitarianists, as the hedonists, as the Enlightenment, as the French Revolution came along. And so as a, a theory of ethics, it went out of fashion very much so, until Elizabeth Anscombe and then Philippa Foote and then Alistair MacIntyre revived it in the 20th century. So that's what we're going to do today. So you can see uh, these two people, Alistair MacIntyre and Philippa Foote, with reference to the ideas of Philippa Foote and Alistair MacIntyre, are the two key named scholars. Well, they're the two modern scholars who have uh, developed developed the theory, applied it today. And there are differences between their versions and Aristotle's version. And that's important to know. Okay. So really good today if we could know how these uh, contemporary developments and what are the sort of basics of it, sort of that Anscombe, McIntyre and Foote develop. Even better if we can understand Anscombe's idea of flourishing as a new secular ethic or McIntyre's differentiation between internal and external goods or Philip Foote's idea of the pragmatic lowering the bar on happiness aim and her, her interest in intrinsic and extrinsic goods and virtues as, as correctives. And then we might get a chance to evaluate some of these guys' uh, work. So a little bit of a review, actually. I thought we'd just go back and review this because this is part of the um, kind of thing that we have to cover here. Uh, you'll, you'll notice it, it says, if you look carefully, um, from its beginnings to modern developments, uh, the things that the cultural, historical and cultural influences. Now, I did a little bit in this, but I thought I would just do a little bit more to make sure you got this. Um, so here we have on the left, ancient Athens, Greece, 400 BC, around the time of, of Aristotle. And here's what it might look like on the right in high society. This was what this, what this nice picture doesn't show, though, is slavery. Look at these well healed, probably been to a grammar school, um, uh, middle class, upper class people lounging, having the, you know, None of them are out in the fields working. None of them are in the quarries digging up stuff. They're playing music. They're quoting poetry. Look at these guys lying back here in their chaise lawn. I used to, used to be very fashionable to have a chaise lawn, a sort of one-armed sofa. Um, not seen many today. They're playing music. They're you know having a bit of a dance. Sounds like they're having a good time. And so from that sort of perspective, very easy to say, as Aristotle says, human good turns out to be the activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. Now, there's a great quote you could learn. Okay, learn that. He goes on to say, and if there is more than one virtue in accordance with the best and most complete. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of virtues. But the human good turns out, what's, what's a good thing to be? Well, whatever good is, it's the activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. But... Here's the reality of the background. Um, have a look at these pictures here. So what, what I've said already, you should close here. Josh, uh, comment on one of these pictures and its importance for the origins of virtue ethics. Off you go. Tell me. Or anyone. Yeah, use your mic. Use your mic. Tell me. Either of these pictures here. No, no, not not sure. Ollie, what do you reckon? What do these pictures got to do with virtue? Sir, are you supposed to be presenting a PowerPoint right now? Oh, is it not coming through? No, I can't see anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I can see it. Oh, I am. You can see it. Might just... Oh, I wonder why it's not coming through. Yeah, I can see it, Josh. Uh... I'll join them and I'll quit and join again. Okay. All right, uh, Flo. So look at the picture in the left, Ollie and Flo. What is that saying about the origins of virtue, of virtue ethics, the sort of society it was built on that we didn't see in the previous pictures? I can see it now. 
Well, there's lots of conflict on the left. You can see kind of yeah. arguments and disputes. Do these people look... Were... Do they look like they're having a good time quoting poetry and all that sort of stuff? No. No. So who might they be? They might be... The poor people. The plebs. Yeah, slaves. Aristotle's oh. society was built on slavery. And it was very nice. Um, this idea of the gentleman of high society, you know, um, very nice. And the actual word means the beautiful person, the beautiful gentleman. Um, and many of the Aristotle's idea of virtue is really quite elitist. Um, and inequality was the norm. Virtue ethics was very nice for gen the gentlemen of high society, but for women, for slaves, not so much. Now, what, what we'll get to today is Elizabeth Anscombe, who is interested in particularly in women and feminism and, and ethics and re her revival of virtue ethics, which goes some way to try and solve this critique of virtue ethics, that it's elitist. Okay. What do these guys in the right think that look like they're doing? Anyone? Um, they look like they're debating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th they're here are the, the higher pleasures. Yeah, they are. Here are the hedonists. So there's this guy Epicurus, um, who advocated the pleasurable life. You know, not too much, not too little, but you know, enjoy a bit of wine and so on. Um. And hedonists were very popular in high society. The intellect was something you kind of aspired to. Hedonism was well means to appreciate life, you know, appreciate a bit of wine, a bit of poetry, have a good time, listen to a bit of music. You know, the pubs are open, let's get out there, and you know. Um, and they didn't see any conflict between the pleasure filled life and, and the and the moral life. Because obviously it's it's perfectly moral to live the pleasure filled life. Now, I was doing a, a lesson this morning with my year seven, and I was pointing out that uh, we were looking at modern slavery, and much of our modern life is built on slavery. It really is. 42 million slaves in the world producing Marks and Spencers. Yes, Marks and Spencers clothes, your Nike trainers, your food, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we have cheap food and therefore a comfortable life. A lot of it is built on the sweat and labor of others who live in some form of bonded or other slavery. So that's the background. Now, we, we thought about, uh, in particular, the influence of Plato on Aristotle and beyond, but behind Plato is Socrates, and behind him are the Stoics. And Aquinas developed these four cardinal virtues. They're not really there in, in Aristotle, so don't get confused. Um, and there are slight variations. You've got to compare lists and words. Uh, the four cardinal virtues are really Plato's, and before Plato, the, so um, the Stoics, the Stoics, wisdom, justice, fortitude, temperance. Now you recognise these as very similar to Aquinas's four cardinal virtues, um, and they reflect this trichotomist view of the, the soul, of that Plato and. and Actually, Aristotle had his own differing version of the soul, but regarded as the basic virtues of the virtuous life. So Aristotle could call upon, the important thing is he didn't invent virtue. Uh, this was an idea that was knocking about. He had his own version of it, his own development of it. Um, in, after Aristotle, Cicero, uh, remember him from Natural Moral Law, uh, true law is right reason in accordance with nature. You remember that quote? Um, Cicero developed a theory of virtue, and it was very important in Roman society, also built on the back of slavery. Um, we know Aquinas. We looked at that last lesson. And Ambrose, before him, talked about the, the theological virtues. We mentioned that last lesson. Um, um, Bishop Ambrose, an early Christian, talked about faith, hope, and love as the the Christian virtues, and Aquinas developed that as the theological virtues, along with Aristotle's, um, well, and really Plato's four cardinal virtues. So we looked at that last lesson, the Summa Theologica. And then in the 17th and 18th century, virtue 
kind of is and isn't fashionable. Um, Machiavelli's The Prince, well, advocates certain virtues and maybe not compassion is one of the main ones, I have to say. Um, the Prince is quite, you know, ruthless, is, is a virtue for Machiavelli's book, The Prince. David Hume, the great atheist, also advocated certain virtues, but he didn't advocate the Christian virtue of um, humility. Along with people like Friedrich Nietzsche, he rejected that as a terrible virtue. Um, the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers and the founding fathers of America all had the notion of virtue, you know, uh, in in the back of their mind. Right here, see if I can remember a quote. Can I remember the quote about human goodness? What did Aristotle say about what is human goodness? It is. It's got this word accord, in accord. Uh, Flo, any, any, can, can you remember? No, sorry, I've got uh, no recollection. All right, let's go back. So Aristotle said, human good turns out to be the activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. So see if you can get that little phrase, the activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. It's a nice little quote to kind of, you know, you got to boil stuff down and learn a few bits, you know, so that would be good. Um, so, uh, Ollie, why is slavery significant in virtue ethics? Um, because the society at the time was built up on slavery. And, um, the flourishing of society was one of the main sort of features of um, eudaimonia. Yeah, and it was the flourishing of some people, but not others. And Josh, hedonism. Why was hedonism significant? I'm not. I can't remember. Remember quite. Um. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, virtue ethics is desire is is happy with the physical body. Aristotle thought of the physical body as the the form of the soul, and he's he's fine with us desiring stuff, wanting stuff, and and it's. Desire is, is closely related to virtue. Animals have desire. It's just that we should have not just physical de desires. We should have sort of, well, we should want to aim for the, the purpose of the human soul, is to, which is to think and not merely to procreate or just f pursue pleasure. Okay. okay, right, let's move on then. So we want to learn today about these three guys. So very simple. We need to know what... Is there historical and cultural influence? What's the main aspect of their theory? How do they differ from Aristotle? And do they address any of Aristotle's criticisms? Do they try and improve in Aristotle's theory? And then we need to kind of do some evaluation of their contributions to it. Now, you notice I've included one Three people, not two. So in the middle, we have Philippa Foote. She's the named scholar. And at the bottom, we have Alistair McIntyre. But you can't really talk about modern virtue ethics without mentioning Elizabeth Anscombe. Elizabeth Anscombe, um, very important uh, female philosopher in the 1950s, uh, who is the person who really revived uh, on her own before anyone else, virtue ethics. So let's go through these. Now, we'll try and summarize it in the end, but you might want to make some notes to think for each of these, what's the context? What are the main things they say? Are there any, why do they, tr how do they try and improve in Aristotle? And, uh, and what's the strength or weakness of their viewpoint? That's what we'll do. Okay, we'll come to the strengths and weaknesses maybe more at the end. So you might be making a table with three columns that looks like this. Um, you can do it whatever way you want, as it were. And there is a... Okay, so let's start with Anscombe. Um, a little bit of history here. So in 1958, Elizabeth... You can go back to the previous one so I can see the um, different things. Oh, sure. So it's kind of history and sort of con context, first of all. So history and cultural influence. Um the, 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 an outline of their, their the particulars of their theory. How do they differ from Aristotle? Do they engage with the, the criticisms of Aristotle? 
And, you know, what are their strengths and weaknesses? Crack and stuff. I get better at doing this each year, I, I think. Be better even next year, but, you know, I'm not doing it too bad, I, I believe. Here we go. All right, so Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, 1950s. Uh, Oxford, I believe, professor, teacher, uh, philosopher. Um, nice to see a female face as a philosopher. Um, and she had a criticism. She thought ethics had become kind of elitist um, and wasn't working for the ordinary person. Um, and while, you know, virtue was rumbling in the background... You know, and we've mentioned some Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, the American Constitution writers, Aris, you know, Aquinas, and so on. The prominence in at least intellectual circles of utilitarianism, Kantianism, Kantian ethics, so deontology, utilitarianism, um, mean meant that virtue ethics, the emphasis on the development of a person, it's was moved to the margins of Western society, at least in terms of philosophy. In practice, a lot of this was still happening in Catholic churches and so on, and in various ways. But it just was intellectually unfashionable to be interested in virtue ethics. And Anscombe was quite a, it was quite a brave move. It was quite a virtuous thing to do, to write her essay, Modern Moral Philosophy. And actually, it wouldn't get a great reception. Um, she wrote it. Not many people paid any attention to it, and it would take Philip Foot in particular, and then later Mal uh, Alistair McIntyre to back her up. And but so important was her essay; it's been given this phrase, the Ari uh, Ariac turn, meaning the the turn to virtue, the turn to character traits, character strengths, the or the return of virtue ethics. Yeah. Um. So the starting place is to say ethics, intellectual ethics, ethics in, at the academic level has become useless. Um, the can, the can, there are, and the different schools that were around the 1950s, all of which are unhelpful to ordinary people. So the deontological moral absolutism of Kant and his laws were increasingly in the, in this, in the, as this 1960s approached anachronistic, out of date. Nobody wants to live by a set of moralistic legal laws. But as was natural moral law, the sort of Catholic teaching, again, people were abandoning Catholic morality in the swinging 60s, but that was approaching in the 1950s. So what then is needed? Well, she said, we need a morality for the ordinary person. A morality of human flourishing. Modern morality, as we as it comes from the academics, the utilitarianists, the natural moral law theorists, the um, uh, Kantians, is all wrong. Now, it's important to note, again, under context, she is a Catholic. She was religious. Um, but she's recognizing that pe ordinary people don't live by natural moral law. Um, she says, we have mistakenly supposed that goodness is a property of actions. Well, that is consequentialism, that's utilitarianism. Rather than people, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flow. Tell me, what's that quote by Aristotle? Goodness is a virtue, a, a tool. Very close. In accordance, it's 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 in accordance with virtue. Remember, let's go back to it. Yeah. What's that in quote accordance here? Accordance with virtue. I got that. Human one. good is so goodness turns out to be the activity of the soul. That's the bit to remember. The activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. I'm going to ask you at the end. That's it. Ha 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 ha. Just because I can. <laughs> uh, let's go back. So. So in this, this 1958 essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, she 
she starts by lambasting Kantian deontology as outdated. Uh, she reminds us that David Hume and Kant as well had undermined belief in the existence of God, therefore any religious basis of ethics, i.e. natural moral law, God can give us rules to follow and we must follow them if we want to get into heaven. So natural moral law, um, Kantian ethics cannot be accepted, as can utilitarianism. So she wants us to rethink beyond an ethics based on either of these and return to an ethics that's based on a person's character um, instead of being obsessed about rules and laws. So a time for a return to virtue ethics. And she wrote her essay and it didn't have a big splash. It wasn't well accepted, um, but it was there like a ticking time bomb ready for some other people to come on the scene. Now, which comes next? Alistair McIntyre or Philip of Foot? Well, I go back and forward in this. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to go with Foot. So let's do Philip of Foot next. Um, historically, they they overlap. They're they're both. Uh, see, Philip of Foot writes first. I really probably should be better to have her next. Now, what I'm going to do is play some video, and hope this helps you. Uh, I'm going to play a video probably by the world's premier virtue ethicist today, somebody you won't have heard of. Her name's Linda Zagreb, and she also is a Catholic, like Anscombe, who's fascinated by virtue ethics. And in terms of academia today, uh, her work is absolutely the best. So this is an introduction to Elizabeth Anscombe and Philip Foote. Here we go. I'm going to have to move my microphone away from the computer, otherwise you get an echo. So I'll just do that now. In 1958, Oxford philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe published a revolutionary and highly adversarial paper called Modern Moral Philosophy. In this paper, she argued that English moral philosophers did not differ from each other in any important sense. They all had given up oh, the idea sure of logic. As well as the idea Sorry, of happiness and the sense of fulfillment rather than oh, we Philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe published a revolutionary and highly adversarial paper mm -hmm. called Modern Moral Philosophy. In this paper, she argued that English moral philosophers did not differ from each other in any important sense. They all had given up the idea of a virtue. Published a revolutionary and highly mm -hmm. adversarial paper called oh, Modern Moral Philosophy. In this okay. paper, she argued that English moral philosophers did not differ from religious foundation. In 1958, uh, awesome. Oxford uh, philosopher uh, Elizabeth Anscombe published a revolutionary and highly adversarial oh, paper called Modern Moral Philosophy. In this Let me just reload that and see if that helps. In 1958, yes. Oxford philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe Sorry, published just, a revolutionary and highly that. adversarial paper called Modern Moral Philosophy. In this paper, she argued that uh, English moral uh, philosophers sorry, did not sorry. differ from each other in any important sense. They all had given up the. Okay, let's just, um, I'll load the whole thing again. Let me just... I have the links in the. In 1958, Oxford philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe published a revolution. You're no longer presenting. I know, I know. I'm going to say In this paper, she argued that English moral philosophers did not nice. differ from each other in any important sense. Okay. In 1958, Oxford philosopher Elizabeth. I have set this all up, people. I am doing my best. I'm very sorry. Uh, here we go. Let me present now. Present on tab. Uh, thank you for your patience. Here we go. Thanks, come. 
published a revolutionary and highly adversarial paper called Modern Moral Philosophy. In this paper, she argued that English moral philosophers did not differ from each other in any important sense. You've got your they all had given up the idea of a virtue, as well as the idea of happiness in the sense of fulfillment rather than pleasure. Obligation had become the central concept in ethics. But they had also detected... Okay, Ollie? Yep. Attached ethics from a religious foundation. In fact, most of them were atheists. For the followers of Kant, moral obligation like meant that follow. each rational being legislates morality for herself. Sorry. Uh, keep moving my microphone. So is that echoing a lot for you, Ollie? Is it? Yeah. Um, I don't know why it's doing that because I, I've moved the, my microphone like six feet away from the, the laptop. Um, we'll try it one more time. We'll try it one more time. Um, uh, all right. Put the microphone far away. Oh, I know. Am I if I switch the microphone? Hang on. Uh, technology. Our. Um, I need to just adjust and just double check what technology is happening. Settings. One, two, one, two, yeah, so that's distance away, done. I'll play a wee bit and we'll just see all of it. It's terrible. I apologize. But Anscombe argued that the idea that each of us is a self-legislator is incoherent. Our own will is not capable of supporting the weight of moral obligation. Only, Only a divine, divine lawgiver law is, is capable of being the foundation of obligation and the, the strong, strong sense desired by these, these philosophers. philosophers. At that, At that time, time, utilitarianism dominated, dominated English ethics. ethics. And, according and according to utilitarians, to utilitarians obligation is a matter of maximizing pleasure for as many people as possible. possible. But, but Anscombe argued, this, this approach leads, leads to calling many, many wicked acts obligations. obligations like the judicial punishment of the innocent. Acting on our obligations cannot simply be a matter of producing good consequences. We can produce good consequences by lying, cheating, stealing, breaking promises, and committing murder. Anscombe's point was that the vast majority of English moral philosophers faced a dilemma. Either return to the idea that there is a God who legislates morality, and is and the, source the source of our moral obligations, obligations or, else or else give up obligation as the central, the central moral concept, concept and go, go back, back to a virtue theory. theory. But, but to, to do, do that, that, she argued, there is, there is much, much work, work to do, to do because, because we cannot, we cannot do, virtue do virtue ethics without first doing a careful philosophical, philosophical investigation of central, central ideas, ideas that moral philosophy needs, needs like the idea of an action, an intention, Desire, desire, pleasure, pleasure motive, motive, emotion. All, all of these, these ideas, ideas were largely ignored in the moral philosophy of the time. time. Her attack, attack on contemporary, contemporary ethics, ethics then amounted to an attack on the weakness of its foundation and the, and the neglect, neglect of the concepts that would be needed to do it correctly. Anscombe herself was both a religious believer and a virtue ethicist. So her, so her argument, argument could, could be interpreted, be interpreted as, as either a plea to return to a religious foundation for an ethical system that is centered on obligation, or a return to virtue ethics. As far as I know, nobody she addressed took the first option. But her paper eventually brought new life into virtue ethics, although it took decades for the paper to become widely quoted, and it became more famous as time went on. 20 years, Twenty years later, later another, another Oxford, Oxford philosopher, philosopher Philippa Philip Foote, wrote, wrote two, two very influential papers in which she argued that we cannot abandon the idea of human well-being and pretend that our moral discourse makes sense. Anyone who uses moral terms must abide by the rules for their use. 
including rules for what counts as evidence for or against any assertion one makes using a moral term. So suppose we want to say that it is a duty to do something. When we do that, we commit ourselves to referring to why it matters if we don't do it. We need to refer to harms and benefits and the fact that one thing is more important than another. But to do that, we need to follow the rules about what counts as a harm and what counts as a benefit and what makes something important. We cannot just decide that something is a harm or is not a harm, that something is a benefit or is not a benefit. Once we do that, we see that we are answerable to certain facts about human beings, facts that we did not make up ourselves. The same point applies to many non-moral terms like the word rude. Foote says, suppose somebody looks at a man walking slowly up to the front door and says, that is rude. You will be puzzled. You'll think that maybe the speaker is from a different culture with different rules of etiquette. Or maybe there are rules in your own culture you're not aware of. But if that's not the situation, the speaker has violated the rules for the use of the word rude. We don't get to say that just any behavior is rude. We must refer to something about giving offense or intending to give offense or violating rules that are constructed to prevent offense or something like that. Without those rules, the word rude has no meaning. The moral I take from foot is that what is rude or a duty or harmful or dangerous or beneficial is not arbitrary, nor is it a matter of personal decision or democratic vote. The way the world is fixes or at least constrains what we can say when we use moral terms as well as a lot of non-moral terms that are connected with them. We cannot pretend to know what morality is about without carefully attending to an investigation of human beings, our physical nature, our psychological nature, and our social nature. Reference to these aspects of nature are embedded in the way we speak about morality. Philip Foote came to UCLA in the 1970s when I was a graduate student there. And she was very influential. Pause. Pause there before it gets off into high academia. I hope that wasn't too echoey for you. Um, sorry if it was. Let's just have a quick look at Philip Foote here. Um, so what are the essentials that you need to know? So virtues cannot guarantee happiness but they can go some way to achieving it. So Philip Foote is writing 20 years after uh, Anscombe. So in the, well, what would that make it? Sort of six or seven, late seventies, early eighties. Um, and she's writing in a tradition that is of ethics and philosophy. That's all about the clarification of language. That's what you heard there. Foote was concerned to establish the meaningfulness of language. Um, now, how does she establish the meaningfulness of terms? Well, she just says that they're just pragmatically, you know, intuitively real or true. And so, for example, the society without any virtues is a very unpleasant place. So like Russian under Stalin was not a nice place to live because people were not virtuous. Um, any society that doesn't correct deviant behavior is not a nice society, um, as it's not agent-centered. It's not, it's not a, a good place to live. So we need virtues. They're pragmatically necessary is kind of the argument. Um, she's not making a transcendent claim. She's saying these are what we need to have a good society. Um, the wise person, um, the wise person directs their will to what is good, not just for themselves, but for wider society. And that means accepting there are things that are both intrinsically and extrinsically good. They're intrinsically good because they're good for yourself and good for society. Um, 
So they're 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 what significant, not in a transcendent way, not intrinsically right and in some sort of, but because they're kind of universal. They're a feature of any given society. These are the virtues this society needs. They are the kind of skills of living in any particular society. They that develop with practice. Um, they are linked with emotion. Uh, Philip Foot talks a lot about emotion and the relevant emotions of in particular situations. So she sees virtues as social correctives that societies need to function well. Um, so she gives an analogy of planks of wood that would warp and change shape if they were left out uh, in, in the rain, as it were. Um, no wood needs to be continually straightened to make it straight, uh, otherwise it warps. Uh, the virtues do the same for human character. They are necessary to straighten us out so we can live with other people. Let me do that through habit and become, in any given society, virtuous. So there's there's quite a sort of, you know, relative ver under link with this. Um, one key way in which Philip of Foot tried to improve on Aristotle's theory and its criticisms was, so there were criticisms of Aristotle's theory by Kant, Immanuel Kant, that, uh, you sh and Kant's theory was that, you, and we'll learn this in September, you should really do the right thing because it's your duty, the ontology. Um, and you can do the right thing, you can do your duty, even if it's not difficult or if it's easy or if it is difficult or if it's not, you know, not easy. Either way, you just do the right thing. But Foote says doing the right thing when it's difficult is a more moral thing to do. Um, and that makes Aristotle's virtue ethics better or her version of it better than Kantian deontology. It, she just thinks intuitively true that it's more moral to do the right thing when it's against what we feel is easy or you know, requires sacrifice. So in that second point, in moral situations, being virtue may be more demanding than in other situations to have the opportunity to steal, and I'm tempted to do so, might shed uh, a weakness on your general lack of virtue habituation. Uh, the virtuous person might just not be tempted. But if you're poor and starving, uh, you might be solely tempted uh, if the opportunity arises. Um, so temptation might say much about the strength of our virtue. Um, but when we practice virtue, it's more moral. That's her, her point. Um, okay, so that's Philip of Foot. Um, we'll just go back and look at Alistair McIntyre. Now, there is a nice video that's a bit long. I'm not going to play, um, but you might listen to it again by um, uh, Linda Zagreb, who is very good, actually, I think. Um, and she is a premier example of a virtue ethicist today. So you can listen at your own time if you want to help support this. But let's have a look at Alistair McIntyre, and that'll be our, and then we'll bring it into land with some um, criticisms of and strengths and weaknesses of these guys. So Alistair McIntyre writes a book called After Virtue in the early 1980s. So really, Philippa Foote wrote in the 70s, and Alistair McIntyre came on the scene in the 80s. 1980s. And he argues in his book, After Virtue, like Philippa Foote and like Anscombe, that the history of Western ethics has become, you know, especially in intellectual circles, become useless. Naturalistic theories of ethics are of little value as they're time consuming and overly complex. And what he means by naturalistic is uh, utilitarianism or they, tries to find, or Kantian ethics. 
They are time consuming and overly complex. No ordinary person can sit down and work out the hedonic calculus or can think, as we'll learn next year and we do deontology, what is the universal maxim that I must follow in this particular situation, as Kant would ask you to. So what we need is a, a, a morality for the ordinary person. Anscombe had said that, Foote had said that, but Mack has his own approach. His virtue-based approach to ethics is more, he thinks, realistic and applicable uh, to people's everyday situations. Um, now, he realizes that uh, Aristotle's virtues were elitist. Uh, the uh, they were different. The Homer and he, he lists the the virtues of Homer and the virtues of the um, uh, the Athenian society. And we don't live by the Athenian society virtues any longer. We have to adapt the virtues for the modern world. So he is um, trying to avoid charges of elitism by adapting in the list of virtues. So he doesn't have the Socratic four virtues. He doesn't have Aristotle's 12 moral virtues, four intellect. He doesn't have Aquinas' four virtues. You see it on the, on the right here. His virtues in his book is courage, justice, temperance, wisdom, industriousness. Well, that's a very modern idea. Hope. We need to be optimistic, he thought. Very psychological, that. And patience. There you go. Patience is a virtue, according to Alistair McIntyre. Um, our society needs an agreed set of virtues, and he thinks this is a good list for modern Western society. Um, we've after the Enlightenment, after rationality and the turn to reason, um, we must look at individual practice and relatives to tradition. These are the, the tradition that we're all part of, he thinks of, is the, we're post-Enlightenment thinkers. We're Western people. We're part of this great Western modern tradition and modern society needs virtues. And here are the virtues he thinks that fits well any functioning modern society. So he also talks about the idea of goods internal to practice. Can you go back to the virtues, please, one second. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So courage, justice, temperance, wisdom, industrious, hard work, hope, and patience. That's, he thinks, the list of virtues that suits us today. And then... So as he thinks about the modern world and the difficulties and challenges we all face, he th thinks this is what a wise person, a, a flourishing person would be like today. And pragmatically, that's what our society needs. Right, thank you. So, oh, by the way, the, the term after virtue is a, you know, after Aristotle's virtue, but it's an update. He's, he's a recognizes there. Difficulties of Aristotle's version of this. So goods internal to pr practices. Well, it's not enough just to practice virtues. We've got to have intention. Now, here's the interesting bit. This is a hybrid. You remember natural moral law has uh, the, um, the internal and the external goods. Uh, so what is an, in an internal good? What is an external good? Um, well, Arist like he agrees with Aquinas, you have your intention needs to be in accord with your action for it to be a moral act. So living the virtuous life depended on, yes, getting into the habit of being a moral and striving to be a virtuous person. Um, but to have meaning and purpose in life, you have to have both internal goods and ex external goods, as it were, um, to achieve the, the good life. You have to have what he calls the good will, the good will. It's your choice, yes. Underneath the virtues must be the virtues of the, the good person. And to be virtuous, you must desire to do virtuous thing. You can't be virtuous if you don't desire to be virtuous. After all, Aristotle is all about desire. Uh, you, have to do, you can't just do them involuntary. Now, that's what Aristotle thought. He thought we would practice virtue until it was involuntary. We just do it. Now, one of the criticisms of virtue ethics is its authoritarianism. It's like conditioning. We're just going to condition you till you do things a certain way. 
And he thought, actually, if, if that's your virtue, if your virtue is just you do the right thing because you can't help doing it, you're not being virtuous because it's not an internal intended act. So you need both the internal intention and the external act for it. So it's kind of a version of natural moral law. It's a hybrid theory. You come across these hybrid theories, and this is one. So, for example, giving money to charity, the act, as long as it was done with the intention, that uh, would be a good act. But if you, you know, just give money for the sake of giving money, then it, you know, for a sense, of, you know, it's that's not a good thing. It's not a moral act. Um. So. The external good is what is good, not specific to the act. It's something good and moral that comes from doing the activity or action. So the external is what comes out of doing the activity. When giving a charity, your example may inspire others. So it's internally good to you, but it's externally good because it's an exemplar. Uh, it's an inspiration. It's an example. Now, of his longer list, he sees the three most important virtues for us today as justice, courage, and honesty. Hmm, interesting. Um, if you remember natural moral law, Bernard Hose talks about ontic goods, a very similar sort of list. Um, I can't remember the ontic goods of um, Bernard Hose, but if you compare them, very similar. And similarly with, with McIntyre vice, um, there are virtues, there are vices. Being virtue does not mean you can't be open to vice. Now, he's very it's very important this because you know the, the challenge is can Hitler you know he had many virtues, um, and he acknowledges that great people of virtue can also be vicious. So being a great violinist, this is an example, could be a very vicious person, a chess player who could be mean spirited. You know, great skill in one area doesn't mean you're morally virtuous in the next. But what he says is important. He says vices like this would prevent people from achieving maximum virtue so hitler might have had many you know in terms of determination performance virtues and so on but because he lacked many moral virtues he couldn't ever achieve maximum virtue so that was a limitation that made him in in the end a vicious person so that's an important point in mcintyre's thinking Right, so there's a little challenge here. We've got three people. Uh, Joshua, give me a summary of Anscombe. Is he still there? Yeah, go on. Give me a summary of what you've got, got on Anscombe. Who was she? When did she write? All right, help my, anyone else? Ollie or Flo? She was a professor at Oxford. Yeah. When was she, she right? Like, uh, the 50s? Yeah, 1958, modern moral yeah. philosophy. Yeah. She was interested in feminism and it being a virtue for everyone, despite being a Catholic, because she thought natural moral law wasn't easy for everyone to follow. She was, she was interested in community, as was uh, Philippa Foote. The idea of virtues of a community are, are relational and... Virtue ethics is more feminist form of ethics, less rational. You know, men like logical, rational, Dr. Spock. Or she thought, so virtues is relational, so more community orientated. Um, good. Uh, Philip of Foot. Ollie, tell me something about Philip of Foot. She thought that virtues don't guarantee happiness. But contribute to them. Yeah. And uh, she thought, yeah. Uh, she thought that uh, virtues were corrections uh, that yeah. needed to be continuous. Do, do you get that sense of it's still quite culturally relative, Ollie? The, co yeah. the, the correctives in this culture, the yeah. language that we use, clarifying the language of virtue and that. Isn't quite universal, but it's it's relative to this culture, this society, um, and there's a critique there hidden in there, isn't there? Um, Josh, you're still with us. Tell us. Yeah, anything. good. Tell me anything you learned about McIntyre. Um, he demonstrates that a good judgment 
um, comes from good character and um, being a good person is not about seeking to follow like normal rules but he and he also sees virtue as a way to supplement rather than replace moral rules. That's really good. Do you remember this idea of internal and external goods? Why does he say it has to be internal? Do you remember that? Or should he? Kind of. Uh, so <laughs> in, intention. Remember, it's, it's like it's in natural moral law. For an actor, oh, yeah. go on, go for it. Well, like the uh, right intention and stuff like that. Yeah. Where like something might, and like the um, things that appear good, like apparent goods that seem good, but yeah, like action aren't. Okay, that's really good. That's a, a, another part of Arist uh, Aquinas theory. Um, apparent and real goods. Um, we did that last lesson. Um, the internal and external is just to say, for an act to be a good act, you've got to want it. So it wasn't enough to habituate virtue in, in a way that you would just do it without thinking so that it just wasn't a temptation to steal something and you had to actually want to be a good person and not not just so that there would involve an element of struggle perhaps um okay let's just uh, bring it into land some criticisms of each of these people uh today okay so you may want to just think about criticisms of each of them and this is that'll finish us off today so Strengths and weaknesses of each of these. Um, just, just anybody from what I've said think uh, of any strengths or weaknesses that might come up. I've given some hints. All right, we'll we'll crack on then. Um, so, Anscombe. Let's start with Anscombe. Uh, in some ways, her theory is better than natural moral law, Kant, and utilitarianism. Uh, it's because it, she's drawing on people like uh, David Hume, if you read her essay. Uh, morality is a sort of social contract or construct. Uh, is a very enlightenment way of thinking. So the strength of her theory is that it appeals to Western post-enlightenment thinkers. Unlike Aquinas' theory, that was the difficulty of Aquinas', Aquinas uh, yeah, well, Aquinas, and Aristotle's early version of uh, virtue ethics. And her critique would be re repeated by Anscombe, uh, by Philip of Foot, and by McIntyre, that modern philosophers have placed too much emphasis on action and reason without emphasizing socially agreed virtues that David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, the American Constitution writers, all emphasized. Um, uh, so much so that we don't know what we mean when we say stealing is wrong. Now, the weaknesses, Anscombe's approach, is, is the relativity that's, that's built into it. Um, it's culturally relative. Um, and... When everything, anything is relative, it becomes fuzzy. Decisions are difficult. It's not obvious how we go about deciding between right and wrong, as James Rachel's in Anscombe's approach. Um, Anscombe argues we should just get rid of the idea of right action, the utilitarian idea of right action altogether, and use virtuous words like an unjust or a dishonest um, person. Uh, another philosopher, William Francana, has argued virtues without principles are blind. There's a great phrase. Virtues without principles are blind. So, um, And Rachel's argues that virtue ethics is incomplete because it can't account for the fact that being honest implies a rule. So it's hard to see what honesty consists in, if not the disposition to follow such rules. But, but why? Okay, so it lacks a grounding. Right, we move on to McIntyre. Um, so like uh, Anscombe, he attempted to resurrect Aristotle's way of thinking to help people find a way of living a happy and moral life today in modern society. So his was an argument for moral, modern morality. So it's his modernness that makes him gives him a strength that um, it's less elitist. His list of virtues is less elitist, elitist than... Uh, Aristotle. So 
he recognizes that more modern society can be Im immoral and therefore needs systems to guide it, logical systems, therefore are well justified. Um, so he is thinking about the well-being of broad society. And sure, we want that and how to be happy. Weaknesses. You read a lot of after virtue and it's very historical. He talks about the Homeric virtues and then the Athenian virtues and then the Middle Ages. And it reads a lot like a history book. But is history and moral philosophy compatible? Um, for an, are, And he talks about tradition a lot. But if the virtues of one society are to eat people, for example, who don't write essays, um, and... That you know, he he also suffers from the relativity problem, um, and you might even not be a good person. You could practice the virtues, but still not be a good person. Uh, this guy Schaefer argues. Um, now, what about his list of virtues? How do we know that is the set of virtues for modern society? Is are they accurate? But how would we know? Um, now, his list of three core virtues, does it even apply to modern society? There's a lot of injustice in modern society, but maybe we need that to just get by. Okay, uh, lastly, Philippa Foot, strengths of her theory, her character-based idea of skills. Um, the, we are clarifying the language of virtue for this society, and therefore virtue becomes like skills to survive this particular culture, this particular society. Um, character virtue becomes the habits of character, the central developed through training. We need heroes, heroes of this particular society who become virtuous, skillful um, exemplars. Uh, whether footballers or such, I'm not sure. So the present age is instrumental. We live in an instrumental age. Um, everything's pragmatic. Uh, we need to be able to bend the rules. We want virtuous individuals who, you know, represent that. But um, what about MPs who lie and claim expenses for duck houses and all sorts of things we've seen in the past? Um, this leads to weaknesses. How do we know that uh, an, an act is... Something he talks about things that are un, an unworthy use of virtue. Hitler cannot be virtuous in the end because he uses his what virtue has in an unworthy way to quote him specifically. But how do we know how, uh, Hitler was immoral? I mean, we, we do intuitively know that, I think, but we can't say that on virtue ethics. Um, foot. Uh, sorry, it's foot we're talking about. Foot, uh, foot's idea of virtue is corrective, is optimistic. Uh, try working with students in the sharp end, and you'll soon figure that out. And lastly, uh, Berkland Russell says this is a bourgeois list of uh, virtues. It's still elitist. However much uh, Foot and McIntyre try and bring it back, it's still quite elitist. Very Victorian, the suspicion of extreme passion, extreme emotion, hedonism. It's a very Victorian stuffy morality. Um, so those are the strengths and the weaknesses. Um, go on, give me a summary. Give me a strength or a weakness of Anscombe. Uh, Josh? Could you say that again, sir? Sorry. Give me a strength or a weakness of Anscombe. Anscombe. Yeah. Um, mine's gone back, sir. Uh, come on, you can learn stuff. Right. So Sorry. better than a strength. Her her work is better than uh, other theories because it it too is, understands the enlightenment that we live in a modern world, um, and morality is a social construct. Weakness. Uh, it's relativity. It's it's relativity. And yeah. decisions become problematic when you don't know what the right thing is to do because there's no absolutely right or wrong. It's unclear. Okay? Yeah. Um, right. Ollie, give me uh, a strength or weakness of McIntyre. It's still elitist and quite Victorian. 
Uh, yes, that would apply to foot in particular. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's okay. Um, okay, so what can we say? Um, so it's it's quite strength. It's modern. It, 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 it's, an, it's an update of Aristotle's theory. It tries to recognize the virtues necessary for modern life. Um, but again, the problem of relativity are the virtues of this tradition or this culture. He talks about tradition a lot. Um, and is his account of, in particular, the modern tradition even accurate? And then we've had... Uh, I'll go on then. Uh, Flo, give me a strength or weakness of foot. She's not here, sir. Oh, she's gone. She's gone. Okay. Um, next, uh, tomorrow, we're going to do one more lesson on uh, Aristotle, some application of Aristotle. Then next week, we're going to do the actual anthology piece for ethics and for Buddhism. Hopefully, I'll record some other videos to help you. And the 10 and 20 mark essays I'd like in by the end of the week or I'm going to be chasing you. Um, well done today. That is it for today, unless anybody's got any questions. Long, long I've got further questions about the um, the um, the references and predicted grades. Okay, let, me just, let me just stop recording then for that. doesn't need to be recorded. Stop recording. Uh,